preach what this book said. I tell you what, Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 2, God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh and cry against it. In Matthew 28, 19, God said, or the Lord told his apostles, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. And in Acts chapter 9, God told Paul, go and stand and speak all the words that I shall give you. So we see from the Word of God that God picks out a man and God puts that man in the ministry. I heard that story a lot of times about uh, how that, that little boy come home crying one day from school and he come home he's just a crying and, and, and sly and boo-hooing. And his mama said, Son, what in the world is wrong with you? And he said, Mama, he said, they told me at school that you and daddy wasn't my real mom and daddy. And that I didn't have no real mom and daddy. And that I was just an adopted child. And that I didn't have no real parents like they did. And it hurt my feelings. Mama, is that true? She said, Wait a minute, son. She went in and got his daddy. She said, They told him at school, What do you want me to do? He said, Well, I guess I better sit down and tell him. He went down and he said, Son, what is wrong? Little boy's just wiping tears like that. And he said, Daddy, he said, They told me at school that you and Mama wasn't my real Mom and Daddy. That I didn't have no real Mom and Daddy like the rest of them did. And Mama and Daddy, that like they had, I ain't got. And you just adopted me. I don't have one like they've got. And the Daddy looked at the Mama. Mama looked at the Daddy and she kind of nodded. And he said, Well, Son, he said, It's true. We didn't want to tell you until the time is right because we didn't want to hurt you or maybe hurt your feelings. But he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. He said, he said, I, I'm going to tell you what happened. He said that day went down to that adoption agency. He said to pick out our son. He said there were 78 babies lined up across there in a big old row. And he said, uh, he said, we looked at all of them down through that. And he said, out of all them 78 babies, we chose you to be our boy. And boy, when he said that, that little boy just brightened up and a smile come on his face. And he said, well, that makes it different to him, don't it? He said, yes, sir, it sure does. And that little old boy walked into school the next day like he owned the place, had his head looking up at the ceiling, buddy, walked in out, his chest stuck out. And they said, what in the world's happened to you? Yesterday you left here crying because we told you didn't have no real mom and daddy like we've got. And you left here boo -hoo and the slobbering and, and all of that. And he took that crown and he said, I want to tell you birds something. He said, it's true. He said, I ain't got no real mom and daddy like you've got. But I want to tell you boys something. He said, when my mom and daddy went down there to get me, there's 78 babies lined up in a big old row. And he said, out of all them 78 babies, out of all them, my mom and daddy chose me to be their little boy. He said, your mom and daddy had to take what they could get. But he said, my my mom and daddy chose me. I said, hallelujah, that's right. The devil just has to take whoever and whatever he can get. But God chooses his men and God puts his hand on his men. And brother, you're special in the sight of God if God's called you to be in the ministry. You are chosen for the ministry. Now here we see one of the greatest preachers in the Word of God, if not the greatest in the New Testament, or the Lord Jesus was John the Baptist. And I want to use his life as a pattern tonight and I hope that all you preachers will take this to heart. I tell you what, when you first start preaching, you think everybody will pat you on the back. I tell you, you think they're just going to love me and everybody will be thrilled to know that I am called to preach. Boy, are you ever in for the shock of your life. I mean, they'll talk about you. They'll stab you in the back. You know what? blows my mind in the ministry I've never got used to it I've got used to being hurt I've got used to people talking about me but there's one thing I've never been able to get used to and that's how a person can hug your neck and say I love you and behind you and in the next breath stab you in the back I've never got used to it. I don't understand why a human being would do that but they'll do that to you they'll do that to you and it's something you never can get used to but they'll do it I'm telling you, if you're starting out in the ministry, you better get some tough skin real quick. Because, buddy, you're going to catch it from every direction. John the Baptist called it. Eugene, nobody in their right mind would do what you
what you're going to try to do. You're either right with God or you're crazy, one of the two. I mean, there you talk millions of people, the world, the devil, demons of hell are against you. And I heard Ed McAbee say many years ago, and I ain't never forgot, I thought about it so many times. He said if the average young doctor had as much opposition against him as a young preacher does against him starting out, he would never perform his first operation. He'd never get that far. If an average lawyer had as much opposition against him as a young preacher does against him, he had never tried his first case. He had never make it that far. There's opposition in the ministry. And brother, you just well accept it and expect it and you're not special. They nailed your Savior to the cross and if they'd done that to the Lord and called Him Beelzebub, how much more they think you're going to think they're going to do me and you in this generation that we live in. They're not going to roll the red carpet out for you because you're a preacher. You're not going to be the best loved man in your town. You're not going to get the most well-loved guy in town award. They're going to hate your guts, to put it mildly. And brother, John the Baptist went through all these things. Now I want to give you three quick things tonight, and especially to him, but it's to all you preachers. And I want you to listen. All you preachers, write these things down in the back of your Bible. There's three things tonight you're going to have to settle. You listen? If you're going to mount to a hill of beans for God Almighty, there's three things tonight you're going to have to settle. I'm going to give you these three things. You're going to have to make up your mind about them, and you're going to have to settle it once and for all, and then stick by it, swim or drown. Number one, you're going to have to make up your mind what you're going to preach. You're going to, what are you going to preach? You can't preach one thing one time, and then the next time somebody sees you, Bill, preaching something else. Find out what's right, what's wrong. Get in that book and find out what it says, and make up your mind the, the Bible you believe and preach. If you believe other than preach it. I hope you don't. But I tell you, you ought to make up your mind what you're going to preach. Amen? I settled it in my mind a long, long time ago that this is God's book, that the King James 1611 was the Word of God to the English speaking people and that that was God's final authority and I made up my mind that everything I believe and everything I preach has got to be based upon what this book said and brother if this book don't say it or teach it I'm not interested in preaching it. Amen? I want to make you to make up your mind what you're going to preach. I know there's a lot of preachers has to preach a whole bunch of stuff that ain't in the Bible. I found enough in there to keep me busy 24 hours a day and you folks too and you got to make up your mind what you're going to preach you got to have a message I heard a story not too long ago about a big downtown uptown church and it'd be a blessing if a lot of those churches uh, would kick their pastor out the door it really would because of the mess they preach in those churches some of them liberal modernists give an essay or a lecture has nothing to do with God or the plan of salvation I guarantee you I'll guarantee you there's probably a thousand churches in North Carolina this morning where Jesus heaven or hell was not mentioned guarantee you now we're used to it we hear it all the time heaven I don't think there's a Sunday ever went by here that the word hell wasn't said whether in the pulpit and reverence or in the parking lot or something I'll guarantee you it's been said here. I'll guarantee you, brother, heaven and hell have been mentioned here every Sunday for 15 years. I'll guarantee you. But, brother, it ain't like that everywhere you go. I'll guarantee you there were messages so-called preached all over this country this morning where the plan of salvation, the blood of Jesus Christ, was not mentioned. I read this story. There were three people sitting in a service one Sunday morning. One of them was a young banker. He was in trouble because of embezzling funds and taking money from the bank that did not rightly belong to him. He was, he was debating on what to do with his life, whether to go into a life of crime or try to get it straightened up. He decided to go to church one Sunday morning. He was in service. Not too far over from him in that same service that morning said an unsuccessful businessman. He was His business was a flop. He was losing money. He didn't know where to turn. So he decided he'd go to church 
one Sunday morning, not too far over in the congregation, sat a beautiful young lady. She had been offered a tremendous amount of money to go into a life of prostitution and pornography. She was debating on whether or not she would do it or not. So one Sunday before she made her decision, she decided she'd go to church and just see if there really was a God. All three of those people were sitting in the Sunday morning service. The pastor that church got up that morning, he stood and brought an interesting message to all the intellectual people in the service that morning on could there be life on other planets. And that's what he talked about that morning. Needless to say, not long after that, the young banker was caught and sentenced to 20 years of prison. The young businessman who was losing money committed suicide. The beautiful young lady went into a life of prostitution and ruined her life. All three of them were in church that morning and you had a sorry, no out hiring in the pulpit that wouldn't tell them the truth about sin and righteousness and judgment to come. I'm telling you this morning, one of these days at the judgment, the blood will be dripping off of that man's hands. I tell you tonight, preachers, make up your mind what you're going to preach. And if you can't preach the Word of God, shut up, shut up, and let somebody else get up. Sometimes they'll shout and it's easy, but sometimes they don't like it. You make up your mind to preach the Word of God anyway. Amen? Do like Peter said, they said, silver and gold, have I none, but I do have something to give you that's better than silver or gold. You know what a lot of preachers do? They say, well, I better not preach on this because we have a lot of families in our church that give a lot of money and they're liable to be offended and leave if they don't. You know something? I don't know how in the world we've ever got the bills paid at our church. Really, I don't. I, we don't operate by a budget. We just pray. I'm the Lord blesses. I, I don't believe I've ever preached but maybe one message on tithing. I believe there ought to be one coming up soon, but, but, uh, I, I don't, as far as I know, and I'm ashamed to say that, man ought to. One time in 15 years, I never even heard, I just say, let's give and that's it. And God's always took care of the need. Now I made up my mind if it ever got to the place. I don't ever want to get to the place where I'm afraid to say this, where I'm afraid to say that, cause so and so's got a lot of money and God, let's Listen, brother, you can't preach like that. you got to be free to say, God, you give it, I'll preach it. God, whatever you put in my heart, I'll say it. I don't care if it hair lips a devil. I don't care who likes it, who don't like it. I'm going to say what you want said. And I'm telling you tonight, you know, a lot of times the devil will lie to you. He'll say, if you preach that, nobody won't listen to you. But you'd be surprised. You stand on the book, brother. These people got enough sense to know the truth when they hear it. Everybody ain't running and scared. Everybody's not intimidated by uh, the, the crowd out there. People, there's a lot of people want the truth and love the truth and God will send somebody around to listen to you and if the crowd you're preaching to won't hear you, God will send you on down the road and give you somebody else to preach to. He'll do it. Then make up your mind what you're going to preach. Don't be like the man in Luke chapter 11 and verse 5 when a man come knocking on his door at night and said, Hey, I've got, I've got company. Can you lend me three loaves? And the guy said, I ain't got nothing to give you. Hey, every Sunday morning, Eugene, every Sunday morning, preachers, every time you stand in front of them bus kids, every time you stand in front of those special citizens, every time have something to give up from the Lord of God, set it on the table. I want to tell you something. Being a preacher is a life of sacrifice. You don't believe it? If you're a pastor in a church, you preach every Sunday. People say, oh, you got it made. You just have to work on Sunday. They don't know what they're talking about. Man, last night I racked my brain. I prayed. You can ask my family. I sat up there in my little building in the woods this evening. And I got up there and I laid down on my face and I said, God, give us something special tonight. God, give me something to say to help this man, help these other preachers. Brother, it takes preparation. 
You don't just get up here and all this stuff just come out of your mouth. I mean, brother, listen, you, I don't even know what I'm going to say when I, I have an outline, but that's just to kind of keep me on track, you know. Outlines are for when you run out of something to say. <laughs> That's right. Hey, just in case, you know, you got that to fall on. But I want to tell you what, brother, you got to make up your mind what you're going to preach. Preach the old book, the AV 1611, God's book. No problem there here, right? I tell you what, somebody asked a man one time, they said, which Bible do you use? He said, I use the one God uses. No problem. No question. You don't know which Bible to use? Use the one God uses. His hand is on this book. Now John the Baptist, he come out of the wilderness preaching. He might look like Eugene, I don't know. Hey, he come out of there, boy, I mean, had locusts and wild honey. Can you imagine him? He was anything but orthodox. He was anything but your average run-of-the-mill preacher. And I've noticed down through the years that God always uses some wild character that's controversial and always in trouble and always in some kind of mess. That's the way God always does. I don't know why. I don't understand. I guess to confound the mighty. I don't know. I mean, God, you a lot of times God will take these smooth, slick guys that ain't never made a mistake nowhere and they're just as dead and dry as a bone. And God will take some old renegade and jerk him up out of the world and call him to preach and use him to do great works. I don't understand that. That's the way the Lord does. The Lord uses who he chooses. And brother, you know what? Old, old John the Baptist come out of the wilderness like a maniac one day. And boy, he just come out there after 400 years of silence between uh, Second Chronicles and the book of Matthew. And he come out of there saying, Pinch ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Messiah is coming. Get right with God. Everybody went, good night. But he'd preach about 15 or 20 minutes and he'd sit down over here and reach in a little old leather pouch over here and pull him out a big locust. <laughs> Bite that head off of it. Lord have mercy. There wasn't nothing sissy about John the Baptist. I can't imagine John coming out, you know, with uh, with jewelry all over him, you know. I mean, really, can you? And, and in a nice camel with a little hood over it, air conditioned, you know, and smelling real nice. Like, you know, I can't imagine. Old John's son, he's rough. He smelled, I guarantee it. But it wasn't a British sterling. I mean, it was sweat, buddy. And and uh, and uh, he he pulled him out some honey. Now, where do you think he got that honey? They didn't have stores with it in little jars. That old boy was tough. He'd been in some bees' nest somewhere. A leathern girdle. What is that? I don't know. He had on a leathern girdle. I'm going to get me a leathern girdle and see if that helps my preaching. I don't know. I don't even know what that was. Just wrapped around him, I reckon. He'd go in there, man, fight them bees like that, grab that honey and get out of there. Probably had bees stinging him all over there. That's a picture. You're going to have to be tough, man. You're going to have to be tough. The ministry's no place for sissies. Hey, it's no place for people who are scared to death of other people. It's no place for uh, uh, wimps who let uh, everything, every little thing that goes wrong scare them half to death. The ministry is a place for men. It's a place for men who have got something down inside of them that makes them brave. And that brother will stand up for God. And old John did just that. And he was baptizing them right and left. He made up his mind what he was going to preach. God gave him the message in the desert. Number two, you man's got to make up his mind who he's going to please. Amen? You can't please God and man both. You can't please men and men both. You can't please women and men both. You may not please your mother and God. You may not please your wife and God. Who are you going to please? I know some preachers, and you have too, that their ministry is pleasing the people. Now, folks, uh, whatever you would have me to do, I'll do. Let's just don't have any problems. And let's just don't fuss now. I promise I'll be a good little boy and do anything you want me to do. Now, they don't say it in them words, but I've just about heard that from the pulpit. Well, I have 
man to his own, man's got to make up his mind who he's going to please. Man. I want to tell you something tonight, and you people here know this. I mean, they, we've never had no problem with it here at our church, and never have had it. Uh, it's just always been this way. It's an understood thing that my job is to please God. Now, I may not always please God, but I want to please God. And I try to please God. And I will do my best to please God. And my job is not to displease you. I want to please you all I can, as long as I can still please God while I'm doing it. But if it comes to my choice to where I've either got to please God or you, I've got to please God. You understand that? I mean, listen, I wouldn't want a pastor that didn't believe that. I wouldn't sit and listen to a man preach that didn't want to please God first. That's the way it's supposed to be. I would, you know, the Bible said in the book of Colossians that whatever we do, we do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. When I preach, when I go, listen, when I go in here tonight, I always go pray. I try, every time I preach, whether I'm here, whether I'm off somewhere, as soon as I get by myself, I'll bow down and I'll say, God, thank you for the service tonight. I pray that somebody was helped or blessed. God, I want to give you the glory. If anything got done, I always do that. I can't, I I can't even think of a time when I didn't do it. I always do that. And brother, if I can go home, when I go home tonight, I'm not going to say, dear God, did the Sunday school teachers like what I said? I hope they did, but that's not what I'm going to say. If I say, dear God, did brother John like what I said tonight? That's not what's going to matter. If I can go home tonight and say, God, I tried to do my best. I said what I believed you want me to say. Now, Lord, I thank you for a good night. I pray you'd use it for your glory. you got to make up your mind who you're going going to please. Amen? Make up your mind. Ephesians chapter 6 said that we're not supposed to do what we do as I service, as men pleasers, but the, 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 out of the heart to the Lord. Paul said, I please men. If I seek to please men, I, I wouldn't be the servant of Christ. John didn't win a popularity contest with men. He realized you can't please them all. By the way, old John got a big opportunity to preach one time. Biggest opportunity of his entire ministry. He got to preach to King Herod. And boy, everybody found out about it. And they said, John's going to get in to see the king. Now the king had heard about John and had confidence in him and respected him. But the king had a problem in his life. And the king's problem was he had stole his brother's wife, Herodias. His brother's name was Philip. And the king stole his wife and and brother, that king had a problem there. And brother old John knew about it. And because of that, that woman did not like John. Well, old John got in there. And he got there. And I can imagine someone getting him down there and saying, Now listen, old John. Now listen. Now let's go up there and let's take it easy now on the king. You don't want to go up there with this old hellfire and brimstone. He's the king, man. Make a good impression on him. Be, be easy on him. He's important. Win him over easy. You know, just rap with him a little little bit. Don't, don't go pointing your finger and all that kind of stuff in the king's face. we got big hopes for you, boy. You, you're a great orator. If we could get some of those uh, rough edges knocked off of you, you could go places. That's what a guy told me down at the camp meeting one night. He said I needed to go to school to get them rough edges knocked off of me. Now what that means is when I when I'm going down the road, I'll hit this and I'll hit that and I'll hit this and I'll hit that. And they say you're just supposed to go down the road. And But you can't help it. You know, if it's inside, you're going down the road, you see something, blap! And you see something, else, blap! That's the, way, uh, that's the way you do when you're preaching. My main job is to preach the gospel, get people saved. But if I see something I'm passing, I'll reach out there and pop it every now and then. There ain't nothing wrong with that. A man ought to. You hate some things you ought to hate! Amen. In other words, I'm not going to spend my entire ministry fighting abortion. I'm against abortion, but that ain't what God called me to do. I'm not going to spend my entire ministry pushing the moral majority. I'm for the moral majority, but that's not what I'm called to do. So what I do is I preach Jesus and heaven and hell and the Bible and live right and do that. And then once in a while when I miss you, I reach out there and pop them. See, while I'm going by, bam! The opportunity comes up 
plenty to reach out there and pop those things. But don't get off the ditch and stay on them. But old John boy, he old John boy, he did it. And buddy, they said, now John, you could be you could be a great preacher if you'd just kind of cool it a little bit. Do you have to scream like that? Do you have to tell everybody they got to repent? What about people that don't need to repent? And just take it easy, John. Behave. And old John said, uh, I'll pray about it. He went and prayed a little while. He got in to see the king. And the king said, come in, preacher. What do you got on you? Old John looked at him, pointed that finger and said, it is not lawful for thee to have her. And the king went, Ooh. you know why? The king knew he was right. But that old woman, she just didn't relate to that message. She wanted somebody to sit down and share the love of God with her. She said, now I enjoy watching Sister So-and-So on TV. She don't condemn me. And I like to study the Bible. But these rednecks like him, coming in here pointing his finger, that's bad manners right there. Who said that's bad manners? Where in the Bible does it say it's bad manners? Point your finger. Come on, Emily. Tell me. <laughs> it ain't in the Bible. She might have made that up. But the, the Bible don't say it. The Bible says slap your hands, stomp your feet, and say, Alas, all the abominations of the people. Yeah. See? The Bible said, Cry out, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression. House of Jacob their sin. That's a far cry from the modern minister who never moves from behind the pulpit and never raises his voice and never preaches on, quote, things. What was that, preacher? It is not lawful for thee to have your brother's wife. Wrong, king. You ain't supposed to take that man's wife away from him and marry her. And the king went, Ooh. Boy, that woman, the demon stirred up in her. And she said, I'll get him if it's the last thing I ever do. Now, I'll tell you something, fellas. You know who will intimidate you preaching? Is big shot women. That's the hardest people to preach to. There's just something about them. Elijah slew 450 false prophets and one woman scared him out of his wits. That's right. Jezebel jumped up and said, I'll have you. Zoom, man, he left town. Now they're going to do it, Eugene. They're going to say, you ever punch your finger at me again, boy? Blah, 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 blah. And buddy, that'll be the scariest you ever get. <laughs> Because you know they got the power to ruin you with their mouth. A wicked, jealous woman has the power to ruin a preacher. Because she just talks about him, talks about him, chomps him down. And she got her husband home that night and she said, I just don't think he had the right to say this, blah, 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 blah. I think you ought to put him in prison. I think that it's a, it's a shame and a disgrace. He has no right to talk to you like that. You're the king of, of this town and, and you're this and you're that. And you ought to be. And boy, he had John put in prison. But John made up his mind who he is going to please. Amen? Make up your mind who you're going to please. Well, let's see where it wound him up. Did he get a raise? Mm -mm. Did he get a new camel? Nope. Did they pay his telephone bill? Nope. Did they send him and Mrs. Baptist on a honeymoon? I don't know why I said that. That just popped out. He wasn't no Mrs. Baptist, I don't reckon. No, buddy. He found himself up in jail with bars around him. Ugh. And the devil said, Some preacher you are, look where it's got you. Here you've stood for God all these years. Here you've tried to preach the gospel. And now look at how they treat you. Look at how they're doing. Boy, I'll tell you what. Old John sat there in prison. He thought he was going to rot there. Somebody come to him. Old John started maybe having a little doubt there a little bit. They said, John, there's a man out there doing such miracles. Nobody ain't never seen nothing like him. He's casting out devils. He's doing this. He's doing that. Is it the Messiah? And John said, I don't know. Why don't you go ask him? 
And they went and asked him. And they said, John said, are you him? Or are we supposed to look for somebody else? And they went back and told him, said, that he heals the sick. He raises the dead. The poor have the gospel preached to them. He said, I ain't never seen nothing like it. You know what old John said? Sitting there in prison. He didn't get discouraged and give up. He said, he must increase. But I must decrease. And as you go along in the ministry, don't ever forget that. You don't keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what ruins a preacher. You keep getting littler and littler and littler. And let God keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Somebody said one time that they went to hear D.L. Moody preach and a man got in and said, I want to hear Mr. Moody. I want to hear Mr. Moody. I want to hear Mr. Moody. I've heard such a great preacher. I heard he was wonderful. I want to go hear Mr. Moody preach. And he finally got in to hear him. And he walked back down the street and somebody stopped him. They said, well, did you finally get to see Mr. Moody? And he said, what? He said, did you finally get to see Mr. Moody? And he said, I didn't even see Mr. Moody. All I seen was Jesus. Amen. And he just kept walking down the street. Listen, if people leave the church talking about what a great preacher the preacher is, they've missed it. Amen? Amen, Amen brother! You know, we're living in a day of preacher worship. We're living in a day when people say, Oh, brother so-and-so, he just want And I'm like that too. There's certain preachers I enjoy hearing. And, I mean, I'd drive a long way to hear. I mean, I don't think that's wrong. But brother, when we leave, we ought to say, I saw the Lord! When you leave here on Sunday morning, I want you to be thinking, Lord. When you leave here on Sunday night, I want you to be talking about the Lord. Don't say, well, Brother Danny did good or Brother Danny did bad. Be talking about the Lord. Be talking about the Bible. He must increase. I must decrease. That's where a lot of people get messed up. They, have, they, they put a preacher on a pedestal and then God lets them fall. All right. The third thing I want to say, and this will be all, and I'll close. You got to make up your mind that you're going to finish your course. Acts chapter 13 says John fulfilled his course. You see, wasn't long after that, they was having a birthday party. And Herodias, that wicked woman, that little girl, I forgot what they said her name was. Bible don't, they just, history says it. Uh, said she come in there and started dancing. And the band started playing. I can't, I guess. I don't know what it was doing. And like this, and she was doing a belly dance right in front of the king. No king, he's about half lit, about three sheets in the wind, about drunk. And he said, Come here, little girl. What do you want? She said, I don't know. He said, I'll give you anything. Half of the kingdom. Some of those teacher asked her Sunday school kid one time. She said, uh, boy, that was a hard question. What about, what would you done if he'd, she'd asked you that question? You said, I want John the Baptist's head. King said, I can have anything I want. What do you want me to ask? Well, she asked the wrong person there, didn't she? That woman didn't have nobody business giving nobody advice. She needed to go to the mother-daughter banquet, brother. Get her act together, amen? That's right. She needed someone to straighten her out. I mean, I like seeing Herodias walk in that place. She'd rebel against everything that was said. She needed it. You know what's wrong with a lot of young girls in this country? You know why they're so messed up? Because their mama's so messed up. Right. Amen? It was a mama I give her that wicked advice. That little girl didn't have nothing against the preacher. By the way, herein lies a great secret. There'd be a lot of girls, young girls, come to this church and love God and serve God if it wasn't for the mamas full of the devil. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's right, brother. The
The case ain't the teenagers. The teenagers enjoy it. It's wicked mamas and daddies that let the devil get in. She said, I can't stand him. Why not? You know why not. He said it wasn't right for me and Herod to be together. So I tell you what you do. If you ask money, we've already got money. You ask for a new camel, you're getting a new one for your birthday as soon as you turn 16. You got all the clothes you want. But mama, there's a new tape out of call. Jump, jump. She said, oh, you're going to get that as soon as I go to Walmart. <laughs> mama, what am I going to ask? Mama said, get the preacher's head. There's nothing more wicked in this whole wide world than a woman that's full of the devil. Get the preacher's head. How vile, how sinful, how ungodly can you get? She went back and she told the king, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Boys, you say, boy, I'm glad that was back in them days. Not doubt a son, where you're going, where we may wind up, it may come to that. The time may come when we seal what we believe with our blood. I'm not trying to sound sensational tonight, brother. The day may be coming when I'll pay for what I believe with my life. I hope by the grace of God I will, I'm willing to do it. You know, my tape's gone all over the country. All over. It's a miracle of God. I ain't had, I guess my, if I was, could stay still long enough, I would have threats on my life. And have had in certain cases like, you know, just verbal threats. But they're going to get you. They're going to hate you. I mean, hey, we're talking serious. We're talking your life here. Is what you've got down in your heart worth giving your life for? Is it that real? Is it just something, oh boy, I want to get up so everybody can see me? Or oh, has God Almighty put something down inside you that won't let you go? That's what you got to have. And you know something? My boys went down there to that day. Ding, 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 ding. Knocked on that old cell door. Old John probably raised up. Looked out and said, what is it, fellas? He hadn't shaved. Rough. Sweaty. Nasty. For a minute, maybe he thought, maybe God was delivering me. I believe God spoke to him and said, Son, you finished your course. The Lord Jesus is out there starting up His ministry now, and this is all I needed you for. And them fellas come in and said, Preacher, we hate to be the one to have to tell you this, but the King has ordered your head. He looked down. He thought, well, God, I know it might come to this. If this is what you require, if this is what I have to go through. Fellas, it ain't always going to be a bed of roses. It's rough. It's rough. If I'd have known what all I was going to face when I first started preaching... I don't know if I could have stood it mentally. But God's given me grace to go through everything. I can imagine old John looked down. A shot of faith went through his soul. He went out there and put his head on that old chopping block. Big old thing had blood all over it. And they put up that big old axe. They said, all right, two or three of you can grab me. He said, you don't have to grab me. They said, you ain't going to try to run away? He said, oh, get her about right there. Come on, boys, I'm going to have a new one before my toes quit wiggling. <laughs> Amen. He said, get me about right there, boys. I can't wait to see the Lord. They said, man, he is the most fanatical person I've ever seen in my life. One of those guys took that big old axe. And probably with one mighty blow, 
And the preacher's head fell off like that. They picked it up, blood dripping out of it, put it on that platter, gave it to the little girl. She brought it to her mama. And her mama looked at it. Started carrying it and saying, <laughs> I just see a witch. I can, man. I just see I She looked like somebody on Adam's family. I guarantee it. You'll never preach to me again. <laughs> what do you think about that? Sometimes I think that head turned around and, and just miraculously says, It is not awful for thee to have her. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that have been wild? If I'd have been writing a story, that's the way it would have happened. Blew her mind, boy. I mean, she'd have set it up on her mantle, you know, and every time she'd walk by, that head said, It is not awful for thee to have her. It is not awful for thee to have her. But it probably didn't. She laughed at it, made fun of it. But tonight, while you and I are here, 2,000 years later, while Herodias screams in the torments of the damned, old John's shouting around the throne and has been there for 2,000 years because he made up his mind to finish his course. I've heard people say, boy, I want to finish the race. You don't finish the race, you finish your course. Now, don't ever forget that. Paul didn't say, I finished my race. He said, I finished my course. The race ain't done to the last one's in. See, it's like a relay race. I get the torch, and I run, 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 until I can't run no more. I hand it to the next guy. The race ain't over. I've just finished my course. See, you understand that? Next guy takes it. He run, 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 run. He hands it to the next fella. And they, when all of them's in, we get there home to be the Lord at the rapture, the race will be over. Amen. And you got to make up your mind to finish your course. All right, Eugene, come over here and sit right here in the middle of this pew. We're going we're gonna to pray in just a moment. I'd like for every ordained man to uh, come around, our deacons come around, Brother Dickie, if you'll come around, Brother Glenn, and sit over here beside him. We're going to have them come to the altar with him and pray in just a moment. Eugene, before God, I charge thee, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. All long suffering and doctrine. One of these days, we may be coming to your funeral, brother. I hope I'm praying that God will protect you and take care of you. And our church is behind you. We're praying for him and Danny. Danny's up there preaching for them, them tonight in New York. Kelly and these kids are going up there. We're talking in the middle of Brooklyn, New York, one of the most dangerous places in America. Probably the wickedest city in the whole wide world, probably. God's called men right here out of our church, and God touched them right here at our church. You know who would ever thought that little old new man, a little old bitty spot right here in town, could have had a witness up in the Big Apple and putting out the gospel, preaching on the street. I'm proud. That these boys are going. I charge you, brother. Preach the word. If you'll just come, kneel here at the altar. The men of God come and get around him. I don't ask them to come kneel around him if they would. And then I don't ask his boys from New York to come behind them. His boy, brother Eugene, worked with these boys and led, I guess, most of them to the Lord. I tell you, it would be a blessing to have these guys around if I was going to preach up there. I want them on each arm before I go like this. I ain't kidding you, boy. I tell you. You know, I'd be prayed up and have mace in my shirt pocket too. But I want you to know we're going to pray as a church tonight and ordain Brother Eugene. And uh, then we're going to have him stand. All you young preachers, why don't you come around? Every preacher in the house. We've got a lot of preachers here tonight. Every preacher in the house. If you're visiting, whatever, just come on around here. Lay hands on them. And while you're sitting here, you pray for these guys. Buddy, you be a preacher in 1992, you got your work cut out for you. 
It's harder than it was 10 years ago. A lot harder. The opposition's stronger than it was a few years ago. They, every one of them stands threatened to be sued, taken to court for their stand on homosexuality, for their stand on uh, things like that. They even wind up in big trouble like that nowadays. A preacher out in California not long ago was sued and taken to court. You know why? Because he had counseled a young man and they got the young man committed suicide. And they said it was a preacher's fault and sued the preacher. They have, our insurance company has counseling insurance on me right now. It's their idea because people trying to sue me. Like if I counsel them or something, then they go out and kill themselves. And they say, well, the preacher scared him and told him he was going to hell. That's the trouble you can get into nowadays. They say it's illegal now in California, in certain parts of California, to threaten somebody with eternal retribution. That means tell them to go to hell. Buddy, that's, the bad, that's how bad it's got. We better pray like we've never prayed before. I'd ask you to bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you'd like to come to the altar tonight for any other reason, they play softly tonight on the instruments. God may be dealing with your heart to come. Father, I pray, Lord, for Brother Eugene, God, that your hand would be upon him. I ask you, dear God, to lead him, to guide him, and direct him for the glory of God. We ask you, Lord, to fill him with power. God, give him strength. Give him grace. God, bring him through the battles, through the hard times, those times that he don't know where to turn that he'll be discouraged, that he'll be tempted. I pray that you'd give him grace to stand. Father, do what ought to be done now in his life. Supply his needs. Take care of him, dear God. Give him that you'd have him to have for the glory of God. I ask you, dear Father, Lord, that you'd anoint him, use him, bless him, lead him, and guide him for thy name's sake. Heavenly Father, I pray that the power of God would move upon him tonight. Give him grace. Give him faith. Give him strength. Supply his needs. Give him souls for his labor. Help him to stay clean. Help him to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. Oh, God bless Brother Danny and them. God bless these boys. Help them to stay right and stand behind Him. Dear God, I pray the Holy Ghost would move upon Him tonight. May Your will be done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Use Him, Lord, for the glory of God. Help Him to preach. Lord, like He's never preached before. We'll praise You and thank You for it all in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord. Just stand up here, brother. Amen. I appreciate Brother Eugene, don't y'all? He got saved in the Marine Corps. Navy. Navy. Sorry about that. In Pensacola, Florida. Somebody witnessed to it. Got saved. Raised Roman Catholic. Now God saved him and called him to preach. And we're going to let you just come around and shake his hand tonight. And uh, this will be the way we end the service. Nursery workers meeting over there. Bus camp workers meeting over there. We'll just skip our preacher's meeting.